Hello, wildlings. I'm your creep smith, and you found my fear forge. <laughs> Lucky you. Hey, wildlings. Something we all share are memories of school. Some pleasant, some embarrassing, some downright tragic. But for some people, they're the ones they wish to forget. If only they could. Tonight's Tale, Part 1 of To My Old Fourth Grade Classmates in Miss Barthard's Biology Class. It's coming for me. Please help. By Bad Fake Smiles. This is an open letter addressed to the 27 other students who endured the strange and traumatizing events that happened during our fourth grade biology class. I know that we all chose to keep silent and buried the memories. Some of you probably went to a therapist. Some might even have moved on, but I know the majority of you are still haunted by the past, like me. However, if you're reading this and you're not a part of said class, please go ahead and tag along with the story, because at this point, I desperately need all the help I can get. My name is Nathan Gann, but people called me Nats. August was the first person to call me that nickname ever since a cloud of Nats chased me back into kindergarten after recess. Same with the constant shoving and tripping. He never stopped teasing me about it, so it grew on me. And everyone else called me Nats by default. As you can see, we lived a pretty typical elementary school life back in Oaks, but that's until fourth grade came along and a new biology teacher was added to the faculty. Veronica Schwartz Barther was her name. She had big sunken eyes to match her tall and thin frame. Her hair was dry and frizzy, but she always tied it into a bun. She always wore long, dark, purple dresses matched with red heels. It made her stand out from the pink and orange blouses worn by the other teachers. Her thin lips made it possible for her to smile with just her teeth and gums, but her voice... Her voice was surprisingly soft and gentle. It always sounded like a mother telling her child that it'll be alright. Ironically enough, she would always call our class her angels, or the perfect set of children that she always wished she had. But of course, that was all just a front. We were all ass-kissers, and she never found out, or maybe we were just too scared. She was very fond of us. Some might even say obsessed. No. No, she was obsessed. I tried my best to recall everything that happened, but I can only remember some stories to refresh your memories. Only the stories that my gut can handle. I remember August Bowers and the soggy towels. When she introduced the topic of microorganisms in class, she taught us that body odor was caused by bacteria, and that's why we all stank after physical ed. After that lesson, she instructed us to wear small towels under our shirts to catch the sweat. She wanted to bring those towels home so that she could take a snapshot of the bacteria and show it to our class. She collected our soggy towels for the whole year, but she never gave us any snapshot. One time, us boys were overstaying inside the locker room, only about five to ten minutes after the bell. We were talking, laughing, playing, teasing. Well, most of the teasing was directed at me. But everyone was enjoying ourselves when the doors suddenly opened and she walked into the room. The cheerful noise stopped and a creeping silence replaced it. She just stood there, staring at us for a good minute. Then she directed her eyes to a shirtless August, and the most disgusting smile spread across her face. You have a nice build. Nice height. Your parents must be proud they produced you. She crouched to meet August's eyes. If only I could bear a child like you. Well, like all of you. August didn't say a word, but we could see him trembling in fear. I assume that the towels are done? She pulled a plastic bag from her pocket, and we 
placed our towels into it one by one. We all left without saying a word, but she stayed inside the locker room for quite an amount of time. If you think that was weird, I also remember Emily Briggs and the Cut, Cut, Cut song. The teacher would have us prick our fingers and put a drop of blood on a slide to observe it under a microscope. I'd guess that you'd think this is a pretty normal thing for a biology class, but the thing is, she made us do it once a month for the entire school year. I could never forget what happened to Emily Briggs that first time. See, we were instructed to uh, do it ourselves. She was scared of pricking her finger. When Mrs. Barther saw this, she approached Emily. What's wrong, my angel? She softly asked, and we stared at the both of them. I don't want to prick my finger. But it's for the class. <laughs> Mrs. Barther, I'm scared. Do you want me to do it for you? Miss Barther took the needle. No. No, I'm scared it's gonna hurt. Emily sobbed. We all expected Mrs. Barther to frown, and we thought we might finally see the day when she would get mad. But instead, her toothy smile grew that much wider. Do you want me to cut them instead? Miss Barther's words echoed within the four corners of the room. Emily stopped crying out of sheer shock. All of us were confused with our mouths half open. Mrs. Barther went back to her desk and grabbed a pair of scissors. She approached Emily again, snipping the scissors as she took each step, swaying her head from left to right while rhythmically singing the word cut. Cut, 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 as she approached Emily's desk. Our hearts dropped at each snip of the large pair of scissors. With a shaking hand, Emily took the needle and pricked her own finger. Snot and tears mixed with her awful crying, making gross bubbles from her mouth and nose, but Mrs. Barther dropped the scissors and patted her head, telling her how she was a good girl while everything was dripping off of Emily's face. After every class, when our little microscope session was done and we'd all left, she would twirl around the classroom, grab our slides, and collect them in an icebox. She looked like a fairy snagging teeth from our pillows. I watched silently from the corner of the door and followed her outside the building. She vanished deep inside the woods, across the parking lot behind our school, and until this day, I have no idea what she was doing with those bloodied slides. Now most of the horrifying experiences that we had were all shared, where some of us, if not all of us, witnessed them together. But the one that really haunts me until this day is something that I alone had to go through. I remember the cups. At the start of every class, she would lead all of us outside and have us form a line. We would go to the comfort rooms as a class, and she would make us go by batches of ten, uh, five boys and five girls, to their respective rooms. She told us that it was to minimize instances of us asking to go out and pee during lectures. What was odd was that she instructed us never to flush the toilet after we peed. She would go inside after each batch was done and take about 10 minutes and then flush it herself. It was pretty odd, but we never questioned it since it was the least strange thing that she had done to that point. One day, while we were taking our exam, I excused myself to go to the bathroom. It was the quarterly exam, so the school corridors were mostly empty. While I was walking in the hallway, I heard a strange clacking noise behind me, and when I looked back, no one was there. I continued walking and heard it again like someone was following me. When I looked back, no one was there. Except this time, I saw it. Hiding from behind, hiding behind a locker door was a purple dress. My stomach churned and my palms started to sweat and I slowly walked forward but with my head still turned keeping a close eye on the dress. That's when she peeked half her head out, eerily, and those big sunken eyes stared directly at me. 
I immediately looked away and started to walk faster. The clacking noise started to get faster as well, and when I looked back, she was in the middle of the hallway covering her face, but even so, her sharp shoulders revealed her chuckling behind her bony fingers. I, I started to run. When I reached the bathroom, I hid inside one of the cubicles. My heart was pounding and my blood was pumping inside my ears. While catching my breath, I noticed that the toilet's tank was slightly open. I don't know what possessed me to do it, but there was a nagging voice inside my head that something was strange, but something inside my head told me that something was odd, that it takes her 10 minutes to flush five toilets. So I opened the tank. There were cups, lots of cups, seven to 10 of them, all filled with amber liquid, piss. The most terrifying thing is that it was ours. Each cup was labeled with names. August, Dominic, Howard, Lance, Nathan. I tried my best to put the lid back on with trembling hands when suddenly the comfort room door creaked. It was slow and loud. I tried to stop my breathing, praying that she wouldn't notice me inside the stall. And I heard her take careful steps, sneaking. The sound of her heels clapped against the tiles. She got closer and closer until I heard her stop in front of the cubicle I was in. There was nothing but silence for the next five minutes. That's when I foolishly got on all fours and took a peek outside the cubicle. She wasn't there. No heels outside my cubicle. I sighed in relief. When suddenly a red shoe dropped from the sky, I slowly looked up and there she was, hanging on the cubicle door, looking down at me. Are you done, Than Than? She asked. I was so shocked that I flinched and slipped, almost hit my head on the edge of the toilet. She got down and opened the door. When I was up and standing, she crouched and got closer to my ear. You need to get back to class, she whispered, caressing my hair. I ran as fast as I could out of that comfort room. A stream of warm liquid dripped down my left leg as I ran back to the classroom. I would never forget that incident, and I still have nightmares about it. What would keep me up at night, however is that when I got home, I felt a burning sensation on the back of my neck. When I took a closer look, there was a scratch mark deep enough to cause a small wound, like she'd been trying to scrape my skin. I'm sure that every one of us felt that Miss Barther was somewhat odd, but I'm here to confirm to you that that bitch was batshit crazy. The soggy towels, the slides, the cups, they were all just things to think about, things that remained a mystery to us. But I wish that that was how they had stayed. I wish I didn't have to find out any of what I have found out. I wish that I didn't have to know the truth. It's been 14 years since the events inside our biology classroom. I've already graduated college, and I'm trying my shot as a digital designer. I know that most of you tried to forget it. Some of you might even have moved on, but for me, it all came crawling back from the grave. And now, well now that thing is coming for me. This part of it started last week when I got a random call. It was a nurse asking if my name was Nathan. It was a nurse asking if my name was Nathan Gann and if I could remember my former biology teacher. I naively answered yes and I was put on hold. When the music stopped, that same voice, that same sick, soft voice greeted my ears again. Than Than? I froze. I couldn't see it, but I knew, I fucking knew, that she was wearing that sick smile. She was dying. This sick bitch was dying. Well, according to her and her nurse. I don't know how she got my number, but she was able to call me. And her last request? 
to see her angels once again before she passed away. I was in a strange position. I honestly didn't know what to do or what to feel. I had shivers down my spine just hearing her call me by that nickname, but then again, she's a dying old lady who never had any children and the closest thing she had was us. So I posted and tried to call out to you guys. To my classmates in class B2 of Oaks Elementary School, I bring to you news that our former biology teacher, Mrs. Barther, is sick and her chances of surviving aren't all that favorable. She told me her only wish is to see us again. If you'd like to join me, please respond below. I waited for anyone to respond, even if only one, to come with me to the hospital. Can't say I was surprised that no one replied. I spent hours and hours contemplating if I should go or not, paced around my room, biting my nails as I think about other alternatives like sending flowers or a fruit basket, but then some random thought about, well, about her ghost haunting me would pop inside my head, further convincing me to go. I was having second thoughts on whether the events that happened back in fourth grade were as terrible as I remembered them, that maybe I was just being too harsh on the old lady. With these things considered, I decided to go. It was noon. Entering the facility's sliding doors, the floor was glossy, but barely white anymore. The same goes for the walls that were beige in hue now. The stenches of disinfectants and molds were dancing in the air. The lobby had a few potted plants, but was barely alive, almost like the patients who were roaming around with their wheelchairs and their dexterous. I approached the nurse's station and asked for her room. The nurse that attended to me had porcelain fair skin with bright red lips, although the dark circles in her eyes either suggested that she was tired or a frequent smoker. I couldn't knock on room 612. I stood there for a good five minutes, trying to bite the skin off my lips. I didn't know what to expect. My mind was conjuring up scenario after scenario. I wondered what she would look like. Would she be weakly? Would she be alive and well? And all of this was a meticulous plan to kill me? The same nurse, red lips, tapped me from behind. Go on. She's been waiting ages for you guys. None of her previous calls came. That was my answer. I had to knock. Come in. A frail voice came from the other side. I'm not sure why the scene that greeted me after opening the door shocked me. The windows were open wide and silken curtains were dancing as the sunlight entered the white room. On the window sat a beautiful tulip, purple, like the color that she once wore and on the bed, with sheets decorated in small blue polka dots, was an old lady. Her eyes were still just as big, but had a more gentle stare now. Her gray hair was flowing to her shoulders, and her smile was pure, excited, but touched. Than Than? The soft voice felt like it finally belonged to her. Her eyes started to shimmer brought to tears that came streaming down her face. I approached her awkwardly and, how are you, Mrs. Barther? Escaped my lips so naturally. I found myself rid of the terrifying image of her in my past. I sat down beside her. She made me talk about my life after the fourth grade, my life in high school and college. It didn't feel invasive or anything. It, it felt like feeding a mother's desire to reconnect to her son. I felt her genuinely being proud and happy for me through every beat of my story. When I figured that no one would come see me, I decided to write letters to my angels instead. Letters? I asked. Yes, here. I figured I'd hand it to you in person since you were coming. I sent everyone else the same thing. 
She produced a white envelope from inside her pillowcase. It had slight creases and a couple of coffee stains on one side. Well, I hope it was coffee. I stayed and chatted with Mrs. Barther for quite some time. We were even laughing at some point. For a moment, my heart was filled with closure and forgiveness, even if we never brought up the things that happened in class. Red Lips knocked on the door and reminded me that visiting hours were almost over. Surprised, I looked at my phone. 8.34 p.m. I got up, said my goodbyes, grabbed the letter, and took it with me. When I got outside the room, I felt like I was crossing to another dimension. I wasn't covered with warm, moldy beige, but instead the hallways were dark, almost to the tint of green. There were lights on the ceiling, but there'd be at least one or two broken ones about every six feet. I felt like I had to take a piss first before leaving, so I looked up for signs of a comfort room. I walked down the hallway alone. Or so I thought. I didn't get that far before I started to hear footsteps slapping on the tiles. I looked behind me only to stare at a long black abyss. I continued walking, my steps slightly sped up, but the footsteps got faster as well, almost running. They sounded bare, like wet feet hitting bathroom tiles. I tried to ignore it, but I heard it come closer. It was approaching me. I looked behind me with fists clenched this time, and there she was. Standing just beneath a flickering light was Mrs. Barther, naked, covering her face. Her skin sagged all over her body, her gray hair flowing down to her waist now. I didn't need to see her covered face to know that she was chuckling. Her moving shoulders gave it away again. I refused to believe the terrifying figure that was in front of me, so I closed my eyes as tight as I could. Go away, go away, I whispered to myself, and as I loosened the muscles on my eyelids, slowly opening them, there was no one. I breathed a sigh of relief and I continued to the comfort room. While inside, flashes of what happened to me back in the fourth grade appeared in front of my eyes. Her sunken eyes, her sickening smile filled with thousands of teeth, when suddenly I heard the front door of the comfort room creak open. It was a familiar sound. It was a familiar situation, and my heart started pounding. I started hyperventilating. I looked at where the sound was coming from, only to see the door slightly opened. A bony, saggy arm came inside and reached for the light switch. Suddenly, everything was pitch black. I panicked. My hands were feeling for the cubicle door. I carefully stepped and tried to navigate inside the dark bathroom. I slipped on the grimy tiles. When I found an empty cubicle, I locked myself inside. I pulled out my phone to turn on the flashlight, looking up and down for any sign of her. That's when the door to the cubicle on my right closed. I'd had enough. I wasn't going to wait for my eyes to see her, so I shouted at the top of my lungs for help, banging on the door with my eyes closed. I felt the world closing in around me and I was fearing for my life. And then suddenly the light switched on. Sir? Is everything all right, sir? A man shouted from the comfort room door. I got out of the cubicle almost hugging the janitor that had saved my life. The world around me was spinning. The fear had gotten into my head. I rushed out of the bathroom and ran to the nurse's station. B Barther, I tried to catch my breath. Is everything all right, sir? Please calm down. Red Lips got out of the station, held my arms, and led me to a chair. <sighs> Veronica Barther, she's outside her room. She's not sick, I rambled on and on. I'm sorry, sir? I asked her to come with me to Miss Barther's room. Sir, you can't just storm inside her room. She stopped my hand as I reached for the handle. She knocked three times before gently opening the door. She wasn't there. The crazy old bitch wasn't there. 
I looked at Red Lips' reaction, checking for validity that I wasn't the only one who was going crazy. So, where is she? I raised my voice. That's when I felt arms wrap around my torso, thin as twigs. I felt warm air on the back of my neck. Gotcha, then, then. Gotcha. She hopped on and rode my back. In a panic, I tried to shake her off me. I felt her disgusting hands grab a feel of my chest as she laughed like an old hag. Get her off me! Get her off me! I shouted. The walls felt like they were closing in and both the nurse and Mrs. Barther's voices were getting muffled. My head was aching and I was finding it harder and harder to breathe. The nurse was finally able to pry her off me. I dropped to the floor, catching my breath, grabbing a hold of my sanity again. The nurse was in as much of a shock as I was. She carefully assisted Mrs. Barther back to her bed with a very confused face. When I got my bearings, anger soon started creeping in. She didn't have any right to humiliate me like that. Not anymore. My hands were still shaking, but I asked her for a reason why she was doing this. I was just trying to play with you again, then, then. Just, just like we used to. She smiled at me. Her eyes reverted back to being wide and sunken. That insane and deranged look of hers was once again present. Her soft voice couldn't fool me again. You have to forgive me, it's just... Her voice began to change, cracking, stuttering. I've always wanted kids, and... You were the closest ones I had. I looked at her eyes and found them full of tears again. I mean, ma'am, I get that, but... If only I was just a couple years younger, she interrupted me. I would let you fuck me. Silence blanketed the room. We simply stared at each other. What? I said I would have let you fuck me. You and all your classmates, so I could have angels of my own. A sickening, salivating smile painted itself across her face. My stomach was in shambles. I, I felt as if my gut wanted to throw itself out of my mouth. The nurse was equally mortified from what she'd just said, but then she laughed. She laughed like a hyena. I stormed out of the room and the hospital and drove home. As soon as I got inside the house, I chugged down a bottle of beer and opened another just as quickly. I felt the need to put alcohol into my system to flush out the poison. The feeling of fear and disgust wrapped around my body like a snake squeezing the life out of me. I wanted to claw my skin off, wanted to bang my head against the wall. I paced around my living room, shouting, screaming, desperate to get it all out. Then I remembered the letter. I grabbed the envelope and gripped it tightly, tore it in two before I could even read what was inside. I flung the crumpled letter across the room. Clink. It was unusual for paper to make that sound. It, it caught my attention. For a second, it distracted me from the anger that I was feeling. I got down to investigate what it was. There, inside the torn envelope, was a small key. I picked it up and examined it. Carved on the handle, it said, Angel. So out of curiosity, I picked up the pieces of the letter and held them together, trying to read what the key was for. To my dear angels, if you are reading this, then there is a good chance that I've passed away. You were the most perfect set of children that I've ever met. To me, you are a blessing from God. There's a reason why your old biology teacher died in a car crash and let you adorable, talented, and gorgeous children under my care. I would like to share with you that reason. Deep within the woods, outside Oaks, I resided in an old cabin. I've sent you the keys to it. May you find the special gift that I left for you. From your loving mother, Veronica Barther. Th that's insane, was all I ever got to say before crumpling the paper and throwing it in the trash can. 
Then my phone vibrated. I was shocked. It, it was a notification from my post. It was a comment from Emily Briggs, the little girl who had once refused to prick her fingers. Hey, I saw the letter. I'm planning to go. You coming? I wasn't sure exactly why, but I had a very bad feeling about where this was going. Beans and Things. It was the name of the coffee shop that Emily and I agreed to meet up at. I did some frantic scrolling on her Facebook to check out what she looked like. I kind of felt like a creep or a stalker, but you have to understand that it had been 16 long years since I had last seen any of my classmates. As for me, I'll probably be easy to spot once I entered the shop since I was the only Asian kid in class. I was feeling all sorts of emotions when I did enter the shop. The smell of roasted beans surprised my nose and made it itch a little. My hands were sweating and my legs were jelly because I really wanted to bail. Partly since I wanted absolutely no part in this crazy teacher's narrative anymore, but also because I was getting kind of insecure. I constantly pulled out my phone to fix my hair and made sure my sleeves were rolled up evenly. I scanned the room for a girl with black hair, wearing a turtleneck and beanie. There were a lot of them. I wish I had asked for the color. Nats! A girl from the farthest corner of the room called out and waved at me. She was wearing a pink turtleneck and a purple beanie. I nervously smiled as I walked towards the table. We shook hands and sat down, waiting for the first person to start saying, well, anything. It's uh, been a long time. I awkwardly tried to break the ice. She simply took a deep breath. Yeah, it has. She gave me the warmest smile after. So, do um, you want anything? I asked. Oh, no, her eyes lit up. It's okay. Uh, August got us some coffee. My eyebrows wrinkled upon hearing his name. Wait, August is here? Yeah. So I shook my head in disappointment. That was something that she should have said before I agreed to go. I grabbed my phone and got up from my chair to leave, but her cold hands grabbed mine and stopped me. No, wait! Uh, look, I know it's hard to be here with your ex-bully. Her concerned face turned into a smirk. Slash ex, she raised a brow. But he contacted me first about it, and I just think there's safety in numbers. I breathed in through my teeth, and before I could reply, a familiar voice interrupted, headed to our table. Sup, Nats? August was wearing the same old denim jacket and wearing the same lame-ass cologne. He sat down with three cups of coffee on a black tray, seemingly unbothered. I was unbothered too, or was at least trying to act like it. I pulled my hand from Emily's and sat back down, fidgeting with my phone. I was looking down, turning it on and off, but I could see with my peripheral that he was indeed looking at me. August took a deep breath. So, uh, Nats, how's it going? Why are we even going? I interrupted. This teacher fucked us up in just a year. She's a creepy old hag. My voice was sounding more agitated. What that disgusting woman had done to me back in the hospital came rushing back again. Emily had a more soothing tone. Kind of sounded like one of those ASMR videos you'd listen to. She answered the question by turning it back to me. You said yourself. She's dying and she's just an old woman. This was ridiculous. Lots of past teachers are already dead. Some of them were also dying. I demanded an answer to why the hell we needed to fulfill this old hag's wish. I clenched my fist from my blood boiling. Money, August replied. That was the initial pitch I gave to Emily, and she came up with this altruistic stuff soon after. Seriously? 
Emily's sweet voice changed. A woman who was seemingly obsessed, no, was obsessed with us, left a gift. She tracked us down, sent us letters. We're probably like the only family she had, August confidently explained. Plus, isn't she a famous scientist or whatever? It's probably her life savings, man. He wasn't wrong, however. Going on this little hunt did make sense. Whatever she wanted to give us was probably something valuable since she was fond of us. It was easy for them to say since they weren't groped by the... B old woman. But I couldn't. I... I couldn't bring myself to regurgitate everything of what happened inside the hospital. I didn't want it buried down somewhere inside of me. I needed this distraction. I needed to know what was driving Mrs. Barther to act like this. She might not have been the best teacher, but it's the right thing to do. She's just a poor old lady. Emily reached for my hand again. August chuckled slightly as Emily gave him the side eye. The word fine found it hard to escape my lips. The next thing I knew, I was driving to our old abandoned elementary school with August and Emily. August called shotgun, because he was always shotgun, at least according to him. Can we change what's playing on the radio? Emily asked him from the back seat. What? Hits too close to home? August replied with a smug face. We continued the ride while listening to Highway to Hell. It was distasteful, but but I had too much going on inside my head to be bothered too much. 9.27 p.m. It was a long drive, but we eventually managed to find the school. We parked the car just outside the rusty gates. Shining the headlights made it conjure up ominous shadows on the building's front door. The gates were chained and locked. I pulled the key from my pocket and tried it. Wasn't a fit. August pulled me back and proposed a different solution. He kicked the chains repeatedly. The noise was only slightly unbearable. Emily and I got worried someone would hear us trespassing, but he actually managed to kick the chain off. Leave it to the soccer player to open old gates. After that, he looked at me and smiled as if I'd given him the pleasure of looking impressed. As if I'd given him the pleasure of looking impressed. We traveled inside the dark woods with only our phones to act as flashlights. Apparently the letters contained maps behind them. I was just too busy throwing mine out to notice. Walking down the path, snapping twigs and crunching dried leaves helped me remember the time when I saw Mrs. Barther disappear inside the woods with the ice boxes of our slides. Somehow it still sent shivers down my spine. We were walking the same steps that she had. The image of her, that happy face of hers, was flashing before my eyes as if she was just in front of us. Wait, I called to them from behind. My breathing was getting inconsistent and I could feel the trees closing in on me. I fell down to my knees and they rushed to my aid. You okay? We're almost there, Emily shouted. August pulled me back up and rubbed my back. I get them sometimes too, he whispered, usually after I wake up from a nightmare. Sometimes, even if I'm wide awake, he offered to turn back, though I dusted myself off and told them it was okay. I wanted to see it through. The cabin wasn't itself anything extraordinary. It stood in the middle of the woods, surrounded by twigs and leaves. Seeing the cabin's dark wooden exterior and dusty windows as we shined our lights on it wasn't really an inviting sight. The moon, although it shone bright, wasn't helping the overall mood either. I found myself nervous. My knees were shaking as we got closer to it. We slowly walked toward the front door when suddenly I heard rustling noises from the trees around us. No, I, I, I can't. I started breathing heavily. We're literally a couple steps from finding the money, Emily then disclosed. I stared at her in disbelief, although August really didn't look that surprised. 
Let's go. Emily got rid of her calm, sweet voice, walking head-on into the dark wooden door. August went inside after her, telling me that we needed to help her. I followed soon after, afraid of what I might see lurking in the trees. The cabin interior was just as you'd expect a crazy old hag would live in. The living room and the kitchen were seemingly blended together, having almost no space for the three of us to roam around. It had a single light bulb in charge of illuminating the whole lot, making it less like a cabin to live in, but a well-decorated tool shed instead. The carpet we were standing on was moldy and dusty, although the description fits rather well on the walls, shelves, and furniture as well. How the hell is this relic running with electricity? August asked as he flipped the light switch on and off. Would you stop it? Emily told him, visibly irritated. Take a look at this. She didn't need to point it out since it was the most noticeable thing inside the cabin. A door slightly opened with a busted padlock. We're too late, Emily grunted. I don't think so. August approached the lock and inserted the angel key. It fitted perfectly. If it was one of us, then they should have just used the key. No point in wrecking the lock or the poor door. August opened the door, and an unpleasant smell came out of it. We all took a step backwards because of how putrid it was. It smelled of rot and alcohol mixed, burning our nostrils. As we shined some light in, it appeared to be a door leading to a basement. A chain dangling from the doorway suggested that it was to light the stairway, but it didn't do anything. Well, ladies first, August smirked at Emily. With an annoyed face, Emily proceeded to descend into the darkness. You can stay here if you want to, August looked back at me. He was probably concerned, but I took it more as a challenge at the time. I walked past him and followed Emily down into the basement. It seemed like a normal one, full of trash at first, but the more we moved around, the more it started to get intriguing. Stacks of wooden boxes were scattered and piled against the walls, and the floor was made of cement, but it felt grimy and slippery. Our shoes would occasionally make squishing noises in some parts of the floor, and neither of us bothered looking at what we were actually stepping on. Old stuff in an old cabin, except for the operating table, shining clean and new in the middle of the room. We all approached the operating table and found traces of shining liquid on its surface, dripping down the sides. What the fuck is this? Escaped my mouth almost involuntarily. We continued to scan the room for anything worth bringing home. Where's the money? said Emily. She approached the wooden boxes and tried to see if she could pry them open. I continued circling the operating table and found a bag of tools underneath. Surgical saws, syringes, hooks, clamps, all of it bloodied and clumped together inside a red bag. I flinched to the sound of broken glass. Emily had clumsily broken a jar that she found inside one of the boxes. She stepped back and made gagging noises because of how badly it smelled. I went to her to check if she was okay and to inspect the boxes as well. Inside were the jars of piss Mrs. Barther had been collecting. What the hell? Why are our names on those jars? She gagged. Opening the other boxes revealed the towels and the blood slides neatly stacked together. She'd been collecting them for sure. It was a thought I'd always had, but I had never confirmed up until that moment. Of course, to Emily, everything came as a shock. She started tearing up, asking us to please leave. Emily, calm down. We need to calm down, Emily shouted. This is invasive. This is insane. This is fucking... She stopped. We both stopped and stayed silent. Creaking noises came from upstairs. Soon, it started getting clear that they were footsteps, but the pattern was weird. It sounded like multiple people were walking above us. What's that? Emily whispered. 
probably whatever was inside this. August called our attention as he was slowly walking back from something. He shined the light at what seemed to be a large metal cage. It stood about eight feet by seven. At the bottom of the cage seemed to be lumps of brown and red substances. I couldn't stare at it long enough to figure out what they were. The bars in the middle of the cage were bent open as if something had gotten out. Holy shit, I gasped, looking at the clipboard hanging from the right side of the cage. Project Angel by Dr. Veronica S. Barther. We heard the footsteps again. August signaled us to turn off our flashlights and pulled both of us into a dark corner of the basement. Whatever it was, it cast its shadow on the basement stairs. We all looked at it in horror with hands on our mouths. It wasn't the silhouette of a person or of any animal we knew. We huddled together, cowering in fear. Then it simply left. We stood there, shaking for a good ten minutes before I turned on my phone light, deciding to speak out and ask if it was time to please get the fuck out of there. Okay, count of three. We run up the stairs and go outside, no looking back. August looked us both in the eyes. My world was spinning again, and this time I was actually ready to vomit. But the adrenaline was keeping me stable. The three of us could feel each other's bodies shaking. But we knew that it wasn't time to screw up. Okay? One. Two. Three. All of us sprinted across the basement. The floor made it hard for us to sprint our full extent or else we would have fallen on our faces. Once we reached the living room, we all ran outside. We turned on our phones and looked straight ahead. Well, that was the plan anyway. We only made it a couple of steps outside the house when I heard August stop running. I looked back to check on him, and he was standing still, looking up. Brother! It was like a choir, the sound of children's voices in unison, screaming. It was coming from the roof of the cabin. Brother! Sister! My jaw dropped and my hand could barely keep the light shining on the thing on the roof. At first glance, it looked like a spider. A gigantic spider whose leg span was around six feet. The more you looked at it, the more you noticed its more grotesque features. In the center of those eight legs was a mass of pink and bloodied flesh, shimmering from all the mucus it was covered in. It was dripping with the same viscous fluids I'd seen on the operating table. On the body were faces, multiple disfigured faces, but they weren't indistinguishable. I saw mine, I saw August's and Emily's and all of the other classmates that I could remember are young nine-year-old faces writhing and squirming on the surface of that monstrosity. I continued shining my light as it sang with all the voices of my classmates I was almost in a trance, frozen in fear after seeing all of their eyes looking at me. Until I felt a big tug on my shirt. Nats, let's go! August screamed at me as he pulled. My legs started working again and we ran deep into the woods as I heard the monster skitter behind us. We ran as fast as we could, Emily being several meters in front of us. Then I heard a lunge from the trees, rustling and crying. We reached the school's front gate. Emily was already holding the door to the front seat, waiting for me to open the car. I hurriedly climbed in behind the wheel as August sat in the back. They both shouted at me to hurry as they scanned for the creature outside the car. Is it gone? Emily whispered as she frantically looked around the car for any signs of the creature. Any time now, Nats. I'm trying! I shouted back at August, desperately trying to get the car started. As we were catching our breath inside the car, we heard nothing outside but silence. The creature was nowhere to be found, either. When I got it running, I put the car in reverse and turned it back to where we'd come from. Then I stepped on the gas. We got quite a distance from the school and no creature was following us from behind, so we collectively sighed in relief. Well, August chuckled, guess we 
Something big landed on top of the car. Out of nowhere, I heard the rear windshield shatter. We were all screaming at the top of our lungs. Nets! August was screaming in pain. I looked back and saw the creature latching onto him, digging its claws into his arms, head, and chest, trying to pull him out through the rear window. August was desperately clawing at my shoulders, calling out my name. I reached out to grab him and stopped the car. Emily wasn't wearing a seatbelt, so she hit her head on the dashboard and knocked herself unconscious. I struggled to pull August back as he was slowly dragged out of the car. I turned to unbuckle my belt for a second, and just in that time, August was pulled from the back seat as if he was nothing but a rag doll. I stumbled out of the car and after them, Augie! Augie! I screamed out into the dead of night. All that was left was the trail of mucus and blood leading back to Oaks Elementary School. I fell to my knees, unable to do anything. I stared into the distance until eventually, Augie's awful screams stopped. I sat down in the middle of the road, in the middle of nowhere, dazed. The sun began to rise and I was waiting for myself to wake up, waiting for my body to start moving, to do something. Emily eventually woke up with a bloodied forehead. I heard her stumbling out of the car where she later sat down beside me and cried. It's been a week since I last stepped outside my room. I haven't slept, bathed, or eaten. There's not a day that passes by I don't blame myself for what happened to August. I also got word that Barther passed away. To my old fourth grade classmates from Mrs. Barther's biology class, I hope you burn those letters. I hope you never visit Oaks again. What I saw in that cabin is something that I will never forget until the day I die. Which I'm guessing won't be too long now. I was keeping in close contact with Emily after all of that happened. And she started to talk to me about how she could still hear the skittering from time to time. After that, she stopped answering my messages. So I guess I want to end this letter with advice to the rest of you remaining, all 27. Lock your doors, because I'm pretty sure... I'm starting to hear the skittering outside my house, too. So, if you want to adopt the doctrine of believing the best in people until they prove otherwise, more power to you. Just realize there are those times and those people that will use that belief against you. Crazy mad scientists, for instance. So stay scary, my wildlings. Go ahead and indulge creativity. But at least try to keep sanity in sight and make the most of your nights.